Hello and welcome to Book Connotation Points Video Snark. If you came here because you thought that this was an audiobook, please stick around and maybe learn some reading and listening comprehension skills. I read books and discuss what went wrong and how they can possibly be fixed. I'm continuing my read through of Betrayed by Kira Cass. Not the first video, go check out the others. Links are posted below. Chapter 29. In the midst of our triumph, this was a hard blow. Hadron's only son was being Quentin's son. I don't know why anybody's surprised by this. After all, they've practically been joking about Hadron's poor constitution this entire time. Although, as I keep thinking about this scene, I'm wondering if his death was the result of his illness or simply because Philippa didn't want to bother with him after the right amount of time had passed. Speaking of Philippa and her little plot with Quentin, she implies that she could be pregnant right now. Reed is quick to call her out, and when she gets angry about said broken promises from Quentin, they call her out some more over how foolish she'd been. Eaton demands Quentin go down and face the literal angry army. Quentin fingers his crown and Hollis thinks that he's remembering his reign in a few seconds. He then tells Eaton that it will soon be him. While well, seeing as how I have no intention of murdering my own subjects, I don't think I'll quite be in the same predicament as you. As they force Quentin from the room, Hollis asks what they should do about Philippa. Eaton says that she should be made to go home and explain to her people exactly what happened, which he thinks should be enough punishment. As they leave, Eaton falls back so that he's walking next to Hollis. Reed has Quentin and is walking ahead of them. Eaton confesses to her that he's really scared and she tells him that he'll be okay. He takes her hand and she squeezes it. He asks that she'll remain by his side while he gets settled and she tells him that once he takes the crown, she'll be jeering and throwing rotten produce at him as a joke to try and cheer him up a little. They go outside where Hollis rejoins her family. Eaton jumps up onto a tall thing where he announces to everybody that he has proof of Quentin's evil deeds. He also announces that Valentina fled the country and that Hadron died that morning. The crowd cheers over Eaton's words, but then a cry comes up, Justice for the Eastoffs! Quentin is quick to cry out that he had nothing to do with that, but the problem is that even if he didn't, he's got so much blood on his hands that literally not one single person believes him right now. Quentin goes on and confesses to stuff like having Valentina's family killed to keep her obedient, but then he says that if they want to know who did it, they should ask Hollis. Let me guess, the slaughter was all a ploy orchestrated by Jameson to get Hollis back. If this is true, then what exactly did he think was going to happen? Because the girl who literally ran away from him with another man would not go crawling back to him after her husband was murdered. Chapter 30 Exactly as I had predicted, Quentin goes on to say that there is only one other person in the world who had once Silas dead. Scarlet then remembers another detail of the slaughter, of how the man who had saved her had a ring like Hollis's father's. She says that the only reason why she was saved was simply because the man confused Scarlet for Hollis. So this was Jameson's plan. He found out about Silas and eliminated him, eliminated everybody hoping my desperation would drive me back to the palace. Instead, it drove me to isolate. Which is exactly what I said at the end of the previous chapter. I'm pretty sure that Hollis would sooner pull her own teeth out than to go back to Jameson. Quentin mocks her pain made fresh by the revelation, but Eaton is quick to remind him that they're dealing with Quentin right now, not Jameson. The crowd starts to chant, off with his head, which is to be expected. Eaton draws his sword, and for a moment, Hollis thinks that Eaton is going to do it, but he holds it up and everybody falls silent. Eaton says that they gather a group of nobles from the neighboring kingdoms to have a fair trial since everybody in Isolate has been a victim of Quentin's actions in some way. He goes on to say that Quentin knows where the bodies are buried, both metaphorical ones as well as literal. Reed then swears Eaton into power. After this, Eaton announces that there's plenty to celebrate, but he asks that if people can't say that they go home and spread the word of what happened today. As the crowd surges around Eaton to congratulate him, Hall slips off into the crowd. She hops into Eaton's horse and takes off with only one goal in mind, revenge against Jameson. Chapter 31. Hollis rides, not quite sure of the way, but hopeful that if she heads west, she can eventually reach Koroa. As she goes, she debates on what to do. After all, she has no proof aside from Christian's words, although it does make an awful lot of sense that when you stop and think about it, even Hollis admits to that. However, as you can imagine, Eaton catches up with her, and he brought his army because of course he did. He reminds her that not only is she alone, but she also has no proof, which are some of the things that she'd been thinking about a moment earlier. Hollis protests that she can't ask Eaton to lead his army into Koroa. He says that he he didn't ask them to do anything, he only told them where he was going and they happened to follow after. She continues on to say that she's not his citizen, but he says that she is, by marriage. He continues on to say that killing isolations is a crime and Jameson must be held accountable. She finally says that they could die, to which he responds that then they'd fall together and that Scarlet would be queen. 
They ride on towards Kuroa with the army behind them. When they get to the border, they come across some soldiers from Kuroa. Ahilas explains to them about how Quentin has been removed from power and Eaton has taken the throne. He wishes to speak with Jameson. They want men to go with them for safety, not only for Eaton's safety, but for Hollis's as well. The soldiers agree to 50 men, which is better than nothing, they suppose. As they continue on, Eaton asks if Hollis doesn't come from royalty too, since the things that she said back there to the soldiers had been so inspiring. Chapter 32 They ride on until they reach Jameson's castle. Hollis sings about all that happened there, but as she looks upon it, the only thing that she can think about is that it now looks like a prison. Again, Hollis expresses her fear and doubts. Hollis Eaton tells her that it'll be okay, that they've already taken down one king, and it's time to take down another. As they ride through the city, people move out of their way in fear. People also do double takes when they see Hollis, not quite sure if it actually is her. The guards naturally stop them outside the gate, but eventually agree to only let Eaton and Hollis inside. Eaton offers Hollis his armor and tells her that she looks like the moon, which is a complete 180 from how she's usually described, and it's oddly poetic and nice. I realize I've said I'd never go near an altar, but I maintain that you are a noxious brat, but I will love you till the very last beat of my heart. I know that I'd said that I'd never go near a crown, and I believe that you are far too full of yourself, but I will love you to the very end. Oh no, it's so cute. They go into the dining hall where people are dancing and generally enjoying themselves. Despite Hollis probably knowing most of the people in the court, the narration only identifies Dilia. It describes her as wearing, and I quote, enough jewels to crush a man. Eaton and Hollis linger in the back of the hall for a moment before people start to notice them. After a while, even the music cuts off. Jameson goes, Hollis, is that really you? And says that he knew that she'd come back. But that obviously makes Hollis angry because she knew that he'd slaughtered everybody she loved simply to get her back. Hollis introduces King Eaton and explains that Hadron died and that Quentin is in the dungeons for treason. Jameson laughs over this and invites them to dine and celebrate with them. But Eaton says no, that there will never be peace between the two kingdoms because of what Jameson has done. Jameson then throws into Hollis' face about how he'd clothed her, let her wear crown jewels, and told everybody to treat her like a queen. Stuff that I'd like to remind you that Hollis never asked for, and for the most part, never really wanted. Allison says that she knows Jameson is a murderer, that she knows that he had Silas murdered, and her parents. So not only did Jameson murder isolate citizens, but also his own citizens as well. When Jameson asks her proof, she says that him sending the widow's friends to her only a few days after is. There's no way that he could have known so quickly, let alone actually release the funds. Jameson then says that Hollis has broken the law because she married another man while being legally wed to Jameson himself. Thanks for listening to my book stuff on YouTube. New videos are up every Monday, but stick around because I sometimes drop random videos on other days too. Just as a reminder, even if you can't financially support me, there are other ways to help me out. The first is watching this video as well as all my other videos. It's also important to like and subscribe. Finally, you can share this video with all of your friends so that they can help as well. If you're already caught up with all of my videos, you can go to Tumblr for my main book snarks, always free and updated every morning. And if you've already read all of my main snarks, then you can find even more snark on my Patreon. You can access it for $1 a month. Members also get early access to my main Tumblr snark. Special thanks to Don, Phoebe, and Nikki for supporting me on Patreon already. If you want to hear your name in my video next week, you either support me on Patreon or make a one-time donation. Do you like my snark so much that you want me to snark your writing? I do that too. For just $6 per chapter, I will tell you how awful that your writing is. But not to worry if you feel like you couldn't take the criticism. I also offer regular book editing as well, just one cent per word. You can contact me on any of my social media platforms if you have further questions. If you want to read some of the things that I've written, you can purchase my works on Amazon. I have a slew of erotic short stories and two full-length novels. I also frequently run flash sales on my stories, and if you aren't following me on any social media, you might want to do so just so you can know when I might be offering things for free. Links for everything will be posted below. See you next week, guys!